from Goodwill and the Ad Council. You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on Boston Free Radio and WBCALP Boston. You are also watching me and listening to me, hopefully, on Somerville Community Access TV or some community TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast. And to them, I say thank you as always. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. And this week, I have five new movies to review for you. But first, I'm going to get into my first segment, which is... What's topping the box office? These are the top 10 highest grossing films of this past weekend. Many of them are hits. Some of them aren't, or at least not yet. But I will let you know the difference as I go down the list. And the number one movie at the box office this weekend is also the number one highest grossing debut movie of the week. And that is The Predator, which grossed $24.6 million here in the States and $54.7 million around the world, and that is against a budget of $88 million. So it's not a hit yet here in the States or around the world. It's off to a pretty good start being number one at the box office, at least in the United States, but it is, still has a ways to go to recoup its budget, and it may not do that. The Nun is number two at the box office, sliding from number one last week, having grossed $18.2 million this past weekend. Against a budget of $22 million, though, The Nun has already in just two weeks grossed $85.1 million here in the States and $229.9 million worldwide. That's a lot of money, especially given its modest budget. But rest assured, there probably will be a sequel to The Nun. And it is a certified hit here in the States and around the world, in case you didn't realize that. A Simple Favor is number three at the box office this weekend. It is the second highest grossing debut movie of the week. It grossed $16 million here in the States and $19.5 million worldwide against another modest budget of $20 million. So it's not a hit yet, but it is very close to at least becoming a tentative hit, which it should by next week. Of course, we'll have to see. White Boy Rick is another modestly budgeted movie that is also debuting this week at number four, being the third highest grossing debut movie of the week. It grossed $8.9 million here in the States and an unspecified amount internationally, but that's against a budget of $29 million. So White Boy Rick is not a hit yet, but it might eke its way to becoming a certified hit, or excuse me, a tentative hit in about two weeks. Of course, we will have to see. Crazy Rich Asians is still doing impressive numbers at the box office. This week, it's number five at the box office, climbing, excuse me, sliding from number three last week, and it grossed $8.7 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $30 million, which is pretty modest, Crazy Rich Asians has so far grossed $149.5 million here in the States and $188 million worldwide, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world. I'm actually surprised it's not doing better around the world, particularly in Southeast Asia, but I can't vouch for that. Peppermint is number six in the box office. This actually took a big dip from number two last week, and it grossed just $6 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $25 million, Peppermint has so far grossed $24.2 million here in the States and $25.6 million worldwide, making it very close to being a tentative hit here in the States, but not quite there yet, and it is already a tentative hit around the world. The Meg is number seven at the box office, having grossed $3.9 million at the U.S. box office and sliding from number four last week to number seven. And I would actually be surprised if this movie came out in the top ten at all. After all, we're well into the fall. As a matter of fact, it's not officially fall yet. It will be in a couple of days. But The Meg is definitely a summer movie, and I'm actually surprised it's still in the top ten, and my guess is I'm not going to see it either next week or the week after that. But still, considering it's a summer movie and fall is creeping in, 
it's surprising that it's doing as well as it is. Against a budget of 130 to 178 million dollars, the Mega so far grossed 137.1 million dollars here in the states and 506.6 million dollars worldwide, making it actually somewhere between a tentative hit and not yet a hit here in the states. It's hard to tell, but regardless of how much it costs to make, it is a certified hit around the world. So very good for the Meg. Number eight at the box office is a movie that's surprisingly sliding. It's Searching, which is a movie I loved when I saw it. It grossed $3.2 million at the U.S. box office, and it has so far grossed $19.6 million here in the States and $45.9 million worldwide. Unfortunately, I can't tell you what kind of hit this movie is. My guess is its budget is around maybe five, no more than $10 million. But what I can tell you is that Searching is doing pretty well for itself and it's not getting the box office numbers at least in terms of where it stands in the top 10 that it deserves i think but i'm also very surprised that the budget hasn't been released but i would consider this movie to be doing well but i can't say what kind of hit it is if it is actually a hit at all Number nine of the box office this weekend is Mission Impossible Fallout, another summer movie that's still hanging in there, probably even more so than The Meg, and this movie's doing incredibly well. It grossed just $2.3 million at the U.S. box office this weekend, but it is in its eighth week in release. Against a budget of $178 million, Mission Impossible Fallout has so far grossed $216.1 million here in the States and $760.9 million worldwide. So as hard as this is to believe, Mission Impossible Fallout, while a hit, is a tentative hit here in the States, but it makes up for it internationally where it is most certainly certified. And finally, number 10 at the box office is Unbroken Path to Redemption, which is another Christian drama film that has been making its way into the top 10. And particularly considering that I am, I've been pretty surprised by how well Christian drama films have done over the last couple of years. I'm surprised that Unbroken Path to Redemption hasn't actually debuted higher in the top 10 but in any event it grossed 2.2 million dollars this past weekend and that's against a budget of six million dollars that's two that 2.2 is only in the united states i don't have the international numbers for you for this one but at a relatively modest opening it doesn't look especially great for the movie but it it does have a budget of six million dollars so it could recoup its losses in the next couple of weeks hi i found a toy dinosaur over on the playground by smith street uh, it had this phone number on it and well i just wanted to make sure the dinosaur made it back to its little owner when i found the little sippy cup i just had to give you a call it's for a kid you know i know my son gets super attached to the smallest things even a fire truck and i'd be happy to drop it off we'd do anything for kids Yet one in six children in the U.S. struggle with hunger. Help end childhood hunger near you. Learn how at feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Welcome to Mr. Bear's Violet Hour Saloon, where the sky is evening gorgeous, the drinks won't cloud your head, and the cocktail nuts are poems. Join me, Mr. Bear, every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Boston time on bostonfreeradio.com for music, poetry, fiction, interviews and more making the lonely a little more bearable welcome back to words on film the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures i'm your host and movie critic dan burke the first movie i'm going to be reviewing for you is the predator which is a film that is being described as the fourth installment in the predator film series but the the sources that i've been finding have not called the predator either a remake or a sequel my guess is that it's a remake not a sequel based on the fact that there is no mention of the previous events that happened in either predator or predator 2 and i wouldn't exactly count the alien versus predator films because those films happened in outer space, whereas the previous Predator films, including Predators from 2010, which I haven't seen yet, take place <clears throat> excuse me, on Earth. And while the special effects for the Predator are impressive and the guy who actually plays the Predator looks really cool in his costume, I didn't especially think very much of The Predator in terms of it being a particularly memorable film, either story-wise or in terms of acting. But let me tell you what this movie, The Predator, is about. 
When a young boy accidentally triggers the universe's most, most lethal hunters return to Earth, only a ragtag crew of ex-soldiers and a disgruntled science teacher can prevent the end of the human race. So I cannot tell you how the Predator compares to the previous Predator movies because truth be told, mm, excuse me, truth be told, and I know this might be a crime for cinephiles like me or my fellow cinephiles, I have not seen any of the Predator films, including the 1987 film starring Arnold Schwarzenegger and Carl Weathers. But that does actually put me at an advantage because when it comes to a supposed remake like this, People who have seen the original inevitably compare it to the original. For me, I have no comparison point or any association base regarding how this movie levels up to the original. But what I can tell you is that the movie is decently acted, I think. It, it certainly has some acting credibility because of the fact that the young boy in this film who triggers the predator attack on Earth is played by Jacob Tremblay, who has not been nominated for an Academy Award for his role in movies like Room, but ever since Room, he's had a very impressive acting career in movies like Wonder and Before I Wake, amongst others. We'll forget The Book of Henry, but even though The Book of Henry was a bad movie and certainly didn't live up to its potential, Jacob Tremblay was okay in it. But the other people in this movie include... Jacob Tremblay's on-screen father, whose name is Quinn McKenna, who's played by an actor named Boyd Holbrook, who I think is an okay actor, but in this film he was just kind of bland. He was the typical guy who is a sniper in the army, and he comes across the alien, and of course he is written off as crazy to the higher-ups who actually know the truth about the alien but want to make him look crazy. And it's a good backstory, but I didn't think Boyd Holbrook was actually all that memorable. Definitely the most memorable actors in the film were the other armed services misfits with whom he's grouped in order to make sure that he's mentally stable. In other words, the other members of group therapy, including a... <laughs> a guy who's experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder and dealing it with it by telling dirty jokes. That guy's name is Coyle, who's played by Keegan-Michael Key, who is definitely one of the best actors in this film. I also really like Travante Rhodes, who plays another misfit by the name of Nebraska Williams. And there's, there are some other people, including a guy named Nettles, who thinks he's Jesus and quotes from the Bible constantly. And there's also a guy named Baxley, who's played by Thomas Jane, whose only real quirk is the fact that he has Tourette's syndrome. And when I say Tourette's syndrome, I mean that he has the stereotypical Tourette's syndrome that you only see played for laughs in films. In other words, he just basically says a lot of inappropriate words at various times. And... For those of you who actually know what Tourette's Syndrome is like, that is the most stereotypical part of Tourette's Syndrome. It's probably not what most people with Tourette's Syndrome experience. But either way, it's played in this movie for a cheap laugh. There's also a decent performance by Olivia Munn, who plays a scientist and a uh, professor by the name of Casey Brackett. And even though she was good in the film... One of the things that really kind of troubled me was the fact that the movie seemed to exploit her for the way she looked, particularly in the scenes when she goes to the underground lab to examine the predator that's captured by, by scientists. And she's taken into a, a part of the lab where she's supposed to cleanse herself or basically get rid of contaminants so it requires her to take off all her clothes and even though you don't see any full frontal nudity of her which is not the most unwelcome thing it still shows enough pg-13 nudity to know that this scene didn't need to be in here i think it was just the filmmakers wanted to see olivia munn with without her clothes and that's really unfortunate that the movie had to stoop to that level but even though this movie does have some interesting characters with keegan michael key probably being the best what also really bothered me is that the character played by jacob tremblay is a misfit kid who has autism and the fact that he has autism is 
elaborated upon in the film. It's not just something you extrapolate from Jacob Tremblay's performance. And while Jacob Tremblay did well in his role, it really bothered me when some of the good guys in the film offhandedly referred to him as retarded. I, it, it's just maybe real people do refer to autistic people as retarded, erroneously, I might add, but it didn't really work in this film. And I also didn't think that it was necessary to put a kid in the film, let alone one who is autistic. Why couldn't the Predator just invade Earth because he could? As a matter of fact, one of the things that really weakens the movie The Predator is that there's no explanation for why the Predator is hunting humans the way he does. And you're introduced to a Predator just flying into the Earth's atmosphere seemingly accidentally, and there's just no characterization beyond that. So The Predator, I guess, is sort of a fun action film, but there's lousy editing and several other weaknesses that gets my rating of a strikeout. I suppose it's fun, but not for me. Question. Would you seat your three-year-old child on a windowsill? And would you seat them in a car seat that's not the correct one? Secure their future. Seat them in the correct car seat. More info at safercar.gov slash the right seat. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. When it comes to parenting, there are no perfect answers. But that's okay, because you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Teens in foster care will love you just the same. For more information on adoption, visit AdoptUSKids.org. A message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, AdoptUSKids, and the Ad Council. <laughs> Never Stop the Madness, Tuesdays at 9 p.m. BostonFreeRadio.com Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is A Simple Favor, which is directed by Paul Fagg. But even though Paul Fagg has directed such movies recently, such as... Bridesmaids and the controversial remake of Ghostbusters with an all-female cast, which I liked but got a lot of unfair backlash. But that's another story. A Simple Favor is not a flat-out comedy the same way those other films are. It's, it's more of, there, there are certainly funny moments in it, particularly with Anna Kendrick as the lead actress in the film, but it's more of a crime drama, and it definitely has bits of mystery within it. And it is about a woman who is a mommy blogger who is played by Anna Kendrick, and her character's name is Stephanie Smothers. And she befriends a, another woman in who's, who's the mother of a fellow first grader of her son's. Her name is Emily Nelson, and she's played by Blake Lively. And this mommy blogger seeks to uncover the truth behind the disappearance of the person who becomes her best friend. And in addition to being a mommy blogger, or I should say probably a mommy vlogger, because she doesn't write on a blog as much as she goes on a YouTube-like site and has these recipes that she broadcasts to a growing legion of devoted fans, but she is definitely the opposite in, uh, from her new best friend, Emily. She is a more of a stay-at-home mom who makes her living from doing these blogs, uh, Anna Kendrick's character does. And also she is very <laughs> visible in her son's life, probably to a fault, as the other mothers in her class certainly gossip about her. But Emily Nelson, the Blake Lively character, is probably the opposite of that. Not only is she largely absent from her son's life, but she's also very cool, calm, and collected about everything. She lives in a very ostentatious house. She works in the city. The, this movie takes place in suburban Connecticut, so the city is New York City. But then something happens when... Stephanie, Anna Kendrick's character, does a simple favor for Blake Lively's character, hence the name of the movie. That simple favor is simply picking up her son from school and just watching over them until 
Emily's husband, Sean, who's played by Henry Goulding, comes back home. But eventually, Emily disappears for a number of days. And I'm not going to give away what happens after this, because there are various twists and turns within this film. And I really, I, I feel so reluctant to tell you about the, the, the twist, because it's one of those things you really have to see for yourself. And things in this movie, as with many movie mysteries, are not always what they appear. This movie is based on a novel written by Darcy Bell, which I believe is the same name. And part of me kind of wishes that I'd read the book before seeing the movie. But as I've stated before in my previous shows, seeing the film, or rather, reading the book before seeing the film is a double-edged sword. In other words... It's, it's good because you at least know how brilliant the original material is, and if it wasn't brilliant, they probably wouldn't make it into a movie. But on the other hand, the movie is almost always better than the book. Almost always. Even if it's a great movie like The Godfather, the book is usually always better. So at least I went into a movie like this, very much like Gone Girl, in the sense that it really took me in, and truth be told, while I won't say that A Simple Favor is better than Gone Girl, I will say it's a lot better than other movies based, or mystery movies based on novels of recent. Especially the, the one movie that comes to mind is The Girl on the Train. And even though The Girl on the Train had a stellar cast, including but not limited to Emily Blunt, I already kind of knew what the twist of the movie was going to be. Maybe the book was better, I don't know. But with A Simple Favor... This movie completely and constantly had me guessing. And that is certainly a testament to not only the screenplay written by Jessica Scharzer, but also the, the stellar acting in this film. I expected Anna Kendrick to do well in this movie, and she certainly met my expectations. But I was doubtful about Blake Lively, because Blake Lively, even though she is very pretty... I, I've always thought she was overrated as an actress, but this performance in this movie is undoubtedly her best to date. I thought not only was she really funny in the role, but she was also very confident and very sexy and also very intriguing. And I did not expect this from Blake Lively at all, especially considering that other movies which required these personality traits of hers, like Age of Adeline, for instance, really let me down, but I am I was very impressed by Blake Lively in this film. I think probably since she's the one who's who goes up missing, she was the character that required the most intrigue, and Blake Lively undoubtedly met all those requirements. And Blake Lively and Anna Kendrick work really well together, but I was also really impressed by Henry Goulding and the chemistry that he and Blake Lively had together in various scenes. It certainly was one of those relationships where you could see that they had some functionality, but you also knew that there was something underneath the surface that wasn't quite right. And what's not quite right, I will definitely not tell you about. But I will tell you that A Simple Favor was well worth it for me. Even though I love Anna Kendrick and just about everything she does, I wasn't so sure about A Simple F Favor because of the fact that Blake Lively was in it. And also, you see her in the the posters that she looks kind of like a Stepford wife, so you're not quite sure what's going on there. But this movie impressed me a lot more than I expected it to impress me. Paul Feig shows he can direct a mystery just as well as he does a comedy, and neither of those genres are particularly easy to do, not compared to a flat-out drama. But this movie certainly exceeded my expectations. It was a very pleasant surprise, and it gets my rating of an unquestionable knockout. I will probably actually be excited to see what Blakely, Blake Lively does next. And, of course, Anna Kendrick, I've been watching for a long time, and I will continue to watch her, but I was very impressed by this film. 180 over 111, and I had a stroke. I couldn't speak. I'd walk. 150 over 90, and I had a stroke. This is what high blood pressure sounds like. You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a stroke are far from silent. 
Get back on your treatment plan or talk with your doctor to create a plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhpp.org. Head to toe, everything's changed. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association, American Medical Association, and the Ad Council. This is Alan Patterson. I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, Old School R&B, Soul, Blues, Jazz, Gospel, Folk, Old School Country, Zydeco, All Music New Orleans, Rockabilly, Bluegrass, World Music, Comedy, Poetry, and Spoken Word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is White Boy Rick, which is a film that is based on a true story about a guy named Rick Wersh Jr., who was a native of Detroit, Michigan, who had a, a staggering, I wouldn't say impressive, uh, resume of things that he did before he turned 16. Basically, he was a street hustler, FBI informant, and drug kingpin all before he turned 16. And this movie details his rise and his fall. And his fall was a pretty hard one. Now, Rich, uh, forgot his name temporarily, Rick Wersh is played in this movie by an actor named Richie Merritt. And what's impressive about Richie Merritt is not only is this his first lead role in a film, perhaps if you don't count Matthew McConaughey, who plays his father, this is his first role in a film, period. And I got to say, for a guy who has never acted in a film before, I mean, look at his IMDb page if you can, because there is nothing on it. It's just white boy Rick and also his appearance on the Today Show. That's pretty much it. He hasn't acted in another film before this. How he got this role, probably from an open casting call, but Richie Merritt actually does really well in this film, and it's not easy, particularly when you consider that he's acting alongside Academy Award winners like Matthew McConaughey and Academy Award nominees like Jennifer Jason Lee and uh, Bruce Dern, amongst other people. But... White Boy Rick tells a story that's familiar, particularly if you've seen crime dramas like Goodfellas or Blow. It's about somebody who comes from a poor background who ultimately learns how to hustle on the streets. At first, he acqu accumulates a lot of wealth and respect, but in the end, he ends up with nothing. That's not really giving a lot away, but... What unfortunately sets this movie apart from better movies like Goodfellas is the fact that even though the lead characters, partic particularly the members of the Wersh family, including Richard Wersh Sr., who's played by Matthew McConaughey, and also his sister Dawn Wersh, who's played by Belle Powley, even though they're given a lot of good characterization. In other words, you really get to know these characters really well. Every other character seemed flat to me, whether they were FBI agents, such as FBI agent Snyder, who's played by Jennifer Jason Lee, or FBI agent Bird, who's played by Rory Cochran, but also the people on the streets with whom white boy Rick does business. I, a lot of um, black people, actually, hence the name uh, white man Rick. I didn't really think all of them were particularly memorable. As a matter of fact, all the members of the, the gang with whom Rich Worsh Jr., Rick Worsh Jr. associates are all not particularly memorable. There's 
there are good actors in there, such as a guy named Boo Curry, who's played by R.J. Seiler, and also Lil Man Curry, their brothers, played by Jonathan Majors. And I suppose they do well with what they're given, but the unfortunate part of it is all these gang members blend together. There's nothing really significant or memorable about them other than the other than the fact that they're black. And in addition to that, there's there are certain moments of Rick Worsh's Rick Worsh Jr.'s life that seem to be haphazardly skipped over. Like for instance, he is an informant for the FBI, and that should be intriguing enough but the only problem is you don't know exactly where his association with fbi agents end and begin so he has he's doing things for the fbi not only including buying drugs but also selling drugs for them and you're not sure if that's common practice or if that's corrupt of the fbi to put him in that kind of position also you're not really sure in the end if this is a common practice to have somebody who's 14 or 15 years old do such undercover work for the FBI. There's, there's really no sense of knowing whether the FBI agents are corrupt or if Rick Worsh himself is playing along with them. There are really a lot of unanswered questions. And there are, as I said, plenty of talented people who act in this film, but some relationships, whether they're familiar or not, are not given enough depth. For instance, it seems like Rick Worsh's grandparents, Bruce Dern and, and Piper Laurie, are visible during certain scenes in this movie, but even though these grandparents live literally within feet of their their son and their grandchildren, you don't see them a lot. They kind of pop in and out. Plus, there's a subplot involving Don Worsh being, uh, running away from home and ultimately using heroin. But you don't know that. You, you know that only from conversations that other people have about her being an alleged junkie, but you never see her shoot up. Sure, she runs away with another guy, but you don't know whether this guy is bad news or not. So, unfortunately, this movie had a very interesting story on its hand. It had some great actors in the film. And as a matter of fact, Matthew McConaughey and Richie Merritt acted incredibly well in this film and really had me believe they were father and son. Of course, it you're taken a little aback by the film when you realize that Matthew McConaughey hasn't dropped his Texas accent, and yet he plays a native of Detroit. That takes you out of the film a little bit. But otherwise, I thought the chemistry between the, the two actors themselves, particularly when you consider that Richie Merritt has had zero on-screen acting experience before this film, it's incredible how well they act together. Unfortunately, the rest of the film feels underdeveloped. Even when Rick, Rick Worsh meets his demise, which I won't give away, you're wondering if, if it's his fault for having gotten into a life of crime, or is it the FBI who might have corrupted that? You don't know by, by the time this movie ended. I know I certainly didn't. So as much as I respected the acting in this film, it gets my rating of a strikeout because it feels like an incomplete film. As a matter of fact, it feels like a preview for a better film. Come on, smile. Oh, honey, he's still not smiling. Maybe he's not a smiler. Yeah, maybe he's just not a happy baby. Maybe he's just being a boy. Or maybe he's teething. Maybe it's just a phase. Maybe he has autism, and we can definitely do something to help. Maybe is all you need to find out more about autism. No big, joyful smiles by six months is one early sign. Learn the others at autismspeaks.org slash signs. Brought to you by Autism Speaks and the Ad Council. Boston Hey, 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 it's Genevieve, a.k.a. Miss Fab 617. And it's your girl, Crystal, a.k.a. The Crystal Lens. We're coming to you from our new show called Boston Come Through. We'll be bringing you the latest and greatest things happening in and around Boston. We'll be talking what? Black-owned businesses, hey. social events, what? And the black experience. Okay. 
How's that sound, Genevieve? I love it. Dig it. Tune in every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio. Boston, come through. Come listen. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And the next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Unbroken Path to Redemption, which is a sort of sequel to the Unbroken film from 2014, which was directed by Angelina Jolie, co-written by the Coen brothers, and starred Jack O'Connell as Louis Zamperini. This movie, Unbroken Path to Redemption, is also based on the same book, which is based on a true story, that was written by Laura Hillenbrand. But other than that, there's really no connection to the 2014 film. None of the actors that appeared in the original Unbroken film appear in this movie. And that connection, or that lack of connection, is jarring for anyone who's familiar with that film. I loved that movie, Unbroken. I thought it was one of the best films of 2014. And that's one of the films that I actually did review for my, <laughs> my first year doing this show. Uh, I remember I, I saw it on New Year's Day 2015, and I was very impressed by it. So Unbroken... Path to Redemption, the film I'm going to review today, has a lot to live up to, and it, in short, does not live up to it. It's directed by Harold Cronk, who has directed a series of Christian drama films, including but not limited to the first two God's Not Dead movies, and he also directed God Bless the Broken Road, which came out a couple of weeks ago. So the, the guy is certainly very busy, and he knows his audience, but... I don't think that the Christian drama twist to Unbroken Path to Redemption is enough to, for lack of a better term, redeem this film. But this movie basically takes off, takes off where the original movie, Unbroken, leaves off. I know there's a better way to say that, but I'm speaking off the top of my head. But when the war ended, World War II... Louis Zamperini's battle really began because even though this is based on a true story, I feel like the alcoholism that Louis Zamperini experienced in this film was, was very thickly laid on. In other words, I, didn't, I wasn't particularly convinced by this film, and I also absolutely hated the scenes where Louis Zamperini, who, by the way, in this film is played by Samuel Hunt, just came off too much like a bad horror film than a legitimate way of, of seeing how soldiers experience post-traumatic stress disorder after returning home. I've seen better, more subtler ways of seeing PTSD on the big screen, whether it be movies like Born on the Fourth of July or American Sniper, they seem to handle PTSD a lot more simply. As a matter of fact, the way that it, PTSD is depicted in these movies don't involve nightmares or their former enemies looking like monsters or resembling Jigsaw from the Saw movies. But unfortunately, that's what this movie does. As a matter of fact, there's one particular person who keeps popping up in, in Louis Zamperini's life. He is one of his main captors in the Japanese internment camp where Zamperini was, was held. And his name, his, his, his nickname was The Bird, and his real name was... Watanabe, who in the original film was played by an actor by the name of Miyavi, who is a Japanese um, singer and actor. Uh, her real name is Takamasa Ishihara. And I thought he did really well in that film. In Unbroken Path to Redemption, he's played by an actor by the name of David Sakurai. And when you're watching this film, particularly if you're familiar with the original Unbroken, you're not particularly impressed by how well this guy acts as the bird Watanabe. As a matter of fact, as I said previously, he reminded me more of, of Jigsaw, the, the puppet from 
the Saw movies. Not the human, but that that puppet with the, the jigsaws painted on his cheeks. And when I was watching this film, I was thinking about previous PTSD scenes from those better war movies. And it didn't involve bullets going into walls or seeing the bullets go into walls or couches moving or the the protagonist feeling like he was drowning or even the really hammy part of this film which was showing the bird Watanabe actually going underwater and grabbing him and also screaming in his face. I thought that was too much like a really bad horror film and not enough like a compelling drama, even a compelling Christian drama. And it, it just goes on for too long. Even the alcoholism here, that just wasn't convincing enough. Or I'm not sure if it was Samuel Hunt himself who just didn't act particularly well. I, I did think he was good in certain scenes, but not when he experienced PTSD and not when he was battling alcoholism. I've seen other movies handle this situation better. Also... He is in a relationship in this movie with a woman named Cynthia Applewhite, who was Louis Zamperini's real wife, who's played in this movie by Merritt Patterson. And I thought that Merritt Patterson and Samuel Hunt had good chemistry together, but the, the editing in this film was so lopsided that there's one scene where Cynthia is so fed up with Louis's alcoholism that she says, I'm going to divorce you and I'm taking my daughter. And then a couple of scenes later she's still in the apartment. And I was thinking, didn't you just say you were going to leave him? Did you even leave at all? So Unbroken Path to Redemption pales greatly in comparison to the original Unbroken film directed by Angelina Jolie and starring Jack O'Connell. I think that if Angelina Jolie and or Jack O'Connell came back to this project, emphasized redemption, it would have been a better film, but Unbroken Path to Redemption, even though its intentions are good, gets my rating of a strikeout because it is having a really tough act to follow, and it also really lays the drama as well as the Christian redemption really thick in this film. Of course, Billy Graham has a, a supporting role, and not the real Billy Graham, but a guy playing Billy Graham, but it just doesn't come to off To buy right. your home, you became a house hunting ace. Learned about loans, scoured neighborhoods, and asked the right questions. If you manage that, you can get your retirement plan on track. Visiting aceyourretirement.org can help. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Tómese un minuto para averiguar si podría tener prediabetes. Visite podriatenerprediabetes.org. Pero seguramente no lo va a hacer porque hay mil excusas. Los niños, el trabajo, no tiene tiempo. Pero no se preocupe. Estar ocupado previene la prediabetes. No, claro que no. Cualquiera puede padecer prediabetes, hasta los más ocupados. Visite podriatenerprediabetes.org. No hay excusas. La prediabetes es reversible. Presentado por el Ad Council y sus socios de la campaña educativa sobre la prediabetes. This is Alan Patterson. I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, Old school R&B, soul, blues, jazz, gospel, folk, old school country, zydeco, all music New Orleans, rockabilly, bluegrass, world music, comedy, poetry, and spoken word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity.
Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is one called Mandy. And even though the movie's title doesn't sound like it, it is an action horror film starring Nicolas Cage. And it's directed by a director by the name of Panos Kosmatos, whose name sounds Greek. I'm not sure if he actually is. Could be Greek or Spanish, I, I don't know. But he is a guy who's been around the movie business for quite some time. He actually started in 1993 as a video assist operator, second unit for Tombstone. And since then, he has directed two films. One is Beyond the Black Rainbow, which is a movie I haven't seen, but I hear it has a cult following. And his this is his second film. And it is certainly a movie that's visually stunning and has some interesting characters in it. It's very, very weird, though. And this is one of those over-the-top performances by Nicolas Cage. And it's a movie that takes place in the Shadow Mountains, and that's a range of mountains in Northern California in 1983. And it details the story of a logger by the name of Red Miller, who's played by Nicolas Cage, who lives in seclusion but a comfortable existence with his wife, Mandy Bloom, who's played by Andrea Riseborough. And Andrea Riseborough is an actress I wasn't entirely familiar with when I saw this film. I, I guess I've seen her in other films such as Birdman and... Um, Oblivion and the death of, death of Stalin probably most recently where she played one of uh, St um, Joseph Stalin's children but in this movie she actually reminded me quite a bit in terms of appearance and acting ability of Shelley Duvall and in fact Shelley Duvall's performance probably in The Shining as well as one of the Robert Altman films in which she appeared came to mind when I saw Andrea Riseborough in this film. But anyway, the two of them live together in the woods of the Shadow Mountains, and then things turn sour when a group of uh, cult followers led by a very eccentric and very demented man by the name of Jeremiah Sand, who's played in this movie with equal hamminess to Nicolas Cage by a British actor named Linus Roach. And this guy, Jeremiah, is not particularly <laughs> charismatic, I, I should say, but despite that, he has his followers. And he's, he's one of those egomaniacs who is narcissistic. And you learn from his encounter with Mandy that he, at one point, tried to make it as a folk artist, but... Record companies turned him down, and so he developed a literal cult following instead, which is very reminiscent of Charles Manson, but that's about the extent to which Jeremiah Sand and Charles Manson have a, enough in common. But this, this character certainly can draw comparisons to either Manson or Jim Jones or a lot of other people who are demented and sick in the head but still manage to have a legion of devoted followers so in any event he comes across mandy on his drive through the shadow mountains with his followers and ultimately kidnaps her and her husband red what happens next i'm reluctant to give away but in any event what happens prompts Nicolas Cage's character to get into a killing frenzy and ultimately seek vengeance on Jeremiah and his blind followers. There is a lot that's going on in this film, despite such a simple plot, and it's a very dark film, despite the fact that there's one particular shade of red that goes throughout this film. In other words, you can kind of see... The art direction, which is very good, by the way, and showing Nicolas Cage's descent into proverbial hell as he is seeking revenge on the, the people who kidnapped him and his wife. And there are moments in this film that drag. The movie is two hours and one minute long, but there are parts in this movie where it feels a lot longer. Certainly the climax is where it really starts to 
pick up steam and Nicolas Cage is welcomingly hammy in this film. But I did think about 30 minutes of the film could have been kept out, especially considering that the character of Jeremiah Sand, Linus Roach's character, oftentimes speaks very slowly. And when he does, he unfortunately has a little bit too much to say, which I suppose is typical of people who are certain people who are narcissistic and maybe that beleaguered the point quite a bit but i still thought that there there could have been more to increase at least a little bit the pacing of the story because some parts of this movie dragged there were also some moments of editing where you wondered what the editor was thinking like for instance when Nicolas Cage is getting into his vengeance mode there's one part where he is actually at a steel plant and manufacturing his own gun but then after that scene you never see the manufactured gun again and you're wondering where it went because he when he seeks vengeance on these this demented cult he uses other weapons besides a gun. And you're wondering why the movie focused on him making the gun when he wasn't even going to hold it, use it, let alone hold it. So th- that's one of the things wrong with Mandy. Another thing is the title of the movie. It's called Mandy. Mandy is a central part of the story but she's not the whole story and whenever i hear the name mandy particularly as a movie i automatically think of the barry manilow song that unfortunately i have stuck in my head right now so mandy is not a perfect film but i did actually get some enjoyment out of Nicolas cage and his demented performance in this movie and i also loved the the set design and the shades of red particularly during the vengeance scenes and as much as i didn't love it and it gets my rating of a checkout it's demented enough and shall i say (laughs) just crazy enough that i actually remember it a, a long time after actually having seen it so i guess that's Praise enough. Listen and imagine. It takes five seconds to send a text. And for those five seconds, you're driving blind. Life is worth more than a text. Stay alive. Don't text and drive. Visit StopTextStopRex.org, a message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, Noise, and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And now that I've reviewed all the movies that I'm going to review for you for this show, it's now time to get into my final segment, which is What's Coming Up Next. This is a spoken word preview of movies that are coming out in theaters near you, unless I say otherwise, this coming weekend. Yeah, there are plenty of films that come out in nationwide release, and there are also some really interesting films that come out in limited release that... If you're not going to see them in theaters, you might see them on streaming, but I can't guarantee either. But here are some of the movies that you will definitely be seeing in theaters near you, or at least seeing on the marquee, not necessarily going inside to see it. But I probably will. The biggest movie that's coming out this coming weekend is The House with a Clock in Its Walls, which is an intriguing title of a movie. And it's about a young orphan named Louis Barnevelt who aids his magical uncle in locating a clock with the power to bring about the end of the world. I have no idea what they're going to do with the end of the world, but this is a movie that's directed by Eli Roth based on a novel by John Belairs. And this is the very first family film that Eli Roth has directed. So I'm very curious to see, especially after the Hostel movies and other really demented films like The Green Inferno that Eli Roth has directed, what he's going to do with this film. But it stars Kate Blanchett 
Jack Black, Lorenza Izzo, and Owen Vaccario. And I, I'll see anything with Jack Black in it, whether it's good or bad. Um, as I said, I, I reviewed Goodfell- uh, excuse, not Goodfellas, Goosebumps, starring Jack Black a couple of years ago. And I remember that while Goosebumps itself wasn't entirely memorable, Jack Black made me laugh just any time he stuck his head out of the bushes or just gave somebody a sneering look. That That's how talented Jack Black is as a comic actor. So The House of the Clock and Its Walls is a book I haven't read, but I will see the movie and I'll let you know what I think come next week's show. The movie I'm really looking forward to seeing is one called Fahrenheit 11.9, which is directed by Michael Moore. And it is not really a sequel to Fahrenheit 9-11, but it follows a similar theme of a controversial president that Michael Moore detests. And it is a provocative and comedic look at the times in which we live. It will explore the two most important questions of the Trump era. And I'm going to censor myself here. How the F did we get here and how the F do we get out? (laughs) <laughs> I'm very tempted to say those words, but of course I'm on the air right now, so I won't. But I am very intrigued. I'll see anything that Michael Moore directs. And the I think probably the weakest film that Michael Moore has directed has been Capitalism, A Love Story, only because it largely told us things we already knew about Wall Street and about people in corporate America who are corrupt There was really nothing new there, and since I've seen it, it's probably the least memorable of Michael Moore's films. Now, this one, Fahrenheit 11.9, is telling most of us what we already know, that Donald Trump is a bad president, but (laughs) remember the statement about the views and opinions expressed on this show. I'll, I'll say it at the end of the show. But I'm still interested to see what this movie has to tell us. If it's going to tell us something we don't know, if it's going to give us a very grim message or a very hopeful message, this is a movie I will see, and I'll let you know exactly what I think about it come next week's show. Another movie that's coming out in theaters, should be near you, is one called Life Itself. This one has an all-star cast, and it's about a young New York couple that goes from college romance to marriage, and the birth of their first child, but the unexpected twists of their journey create reverberations that echo over continents and through lifetimes. I'm not sure exactly where that is going. That's a very interesting synopsis, but the movie stars Oscar Isaac, Olivia Wilde, Olivia Cook, Annette Bening, Mandy Patinkin, and Antonio Banderas. And this is a movie I don't know what to expect. It certainly has some great actors in it. But I will see it, and I will let you know what I think come next week's show. And the last film I'll mention is one called Assassination Nation. This one's directed by Sam Levinson, and it's about a quiet all-American town of Salem that absolutely lost its mind. And this is a thousand percent a true story, according to the synopsis. The movie stars four women, Odessa Young, Hari Neff, Suki Waterhouse, and Abra. I'm not, I am not familiar with these women at all. Certainly from the poster of this film, it, they certainly are attractive, but that's about all I know. But that's a movie I will see, and I'll let you know what I think come next week's show. And that just about does it for Words on Film for this show. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, and I am your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And just as a reminder, the views and opinions expressed on Words on Film are solely those of your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, about movies or otherwise. And my views do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees who are working at the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. But as always, I had a lot of fun discussing movies with you guys. I've got more movies to see next week, either in theaters or on video on demand, and I'll let you know the difference. But until then, this is Dan Burke saying I'll see you at the movies. (laughs) 